The Spirituality Mind Body Institute, now in our 12th year, has taken up the charge of waking up America. We're in a very tough time with multiple troubles that have yet to be resolved. And yesterday's way of thinking is simply not going to resolve the current challenges we face today. And so how can we innovate? How can we truly see through to the other side into a new society, what we might call an awakened society? It turns out that we all have exactly what we need. We are all endowed already with the capacity for what we might call awakened awareness. We have within our brain the dormant circuits ready to run that will allow us to see into the deeper nature of life, to receive inspiration, and see a magnificent realm of possibility beyond what we might even have imagined. I'm delighted to share with you today some of our recent alums and our current doctoral students in the Spirituality Mind Body Institute, as well as former postdoc and now director of our school initiative, Dr. Amy Chapman. I will introduce to you Dr. Susa Scalora, Dr. Mish Anderson, and not too far from now, soon to be Dr. Elizabeth Mistura, one at a time as they share their very powerful contributions way ahead of their time for awakening society. What's this all based on? Awakened work is based foundationally on basic science. Starting in the late 1990s, together with my lab and in time other labs have joined us, the field of science has generated a very clear roadmap, if you will, for the developmental course of innate spirituality. Every one of us, man, woman, and child, is endowed with this capacity. We know that through the lens of twin studies. How much so? About one-third innate, two-thirds environmentally formed is this capacity for deep, transcendent awareness. And yet, by way of analogy, we can strengthen that muscle or it can lay fallow. There are many ways we can strengthen our awakened awareness. In the United States, if you might envision an overlapping Venn diagram, religion and spirituality, about two thirds of people are at the intersection. They say, I am spiritual and I am religious. My deep spiritual connection is held in the prayers, meditations, text, community traditions of my faith. 30% of millennials and fewer with each older generation say I am spiritual but I am not religious. For me, spirituality is felt in nature with my family, in music and art. Whether or not we are religious and irrespective of what denomination we may be, Catholic, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, we all have the same neuro seat of spiritual perception, the same docking station, if you will, of transcendent awareness. We see it in the MRI. It involves four components. The first and only the first is shared with mindfulness, which is truly to just quiet our brain, stop the racket. And once we've achieved presence, we're then at the threshold where we can cross over into a state of awakened awareness, characterized by three neuro capacities. The first is that the parietal puts in and out hard boundaries so that we're aware that we are at once magnificently diverse, racially, in terms of our gender, in terms of our location across the world. And yet there is at the same time a oneness, a common seat of human experience, one human heart. We are aware through the bonding network being engaged just as we were held and loved in our parents' arms that life itself, whether we say God, the universe, Jesus, Allah, Hashem, we are held. And finally, we move from a very narrow, gotta have it, strategic, tactical strain of frame of mind, which indeed we do need sometimes, but which is alone insufficient to square with the great flux and dynamism of life, as we've certainly seen in the past year and a half, from a top-down dorsal to a bottom-up ventral attention system, so that as much as I wanted to get out the red door and I pushed for the red door and A plus B plus C was all lined up tactically in my life to get that job, to marry that spouse, to get that apartment, to achieve that career, when the red door is stuck and achieving awareness alone cannot get us through life, we have the opportunity to release narrow attachments and move from the dorsal top down to the bottom up ventral attention network, awakened attention, if you will, through which for the first time, the yellow door pops 
and the yellow door, I might have charged right by that, but it leads to someone or a new experience or a new way of being beyond what I might even have imagined. Between the dimensions of our latent, ready to go, awakened brain, we see, feel, and know that we are loved, we are held, we are guided, and we are never alone. It is not a thought, it is not a theory, it is not a theology, it is a perception. Our awakened awareness is our birthright. And yet, how do we build that muscle? And what happens if we do? When we cultivate our natural capacity for awakened awareness, we are less depressed. How much so? 60% less likely to have major depression. We are less addicted. How much so? 80% less likely to meet diagnostic criteria for addiction. And 82% less likely to be vulnerable to the epidemic of our time, completed suicide. The rate of death by suicide has surpassed the rate of death by auto accident in high school, which now presses down into middle school. How do we awaken children in the United States and children around the world? How do we nourish? How might we provide the rain and sunshine to cultivate their natural seeds of awareness? And similarly, how in college can this be rejuvenated, rebooted as we go through a hardwired phase, a surge of spiritual growth, spiritual individuation marked by a 50% increase in the heritable contribution seen through longitudinal twin studies. And finally, knowing that prevention, treatment, and wellness are points on the continuum, how can we support human growth and flourishing at all points, in times of difficulty, in times of renewal, and in times of development. Today, based on the roadmap of science that shows our birthright of awakening to be just within reach, a quarter inch under the surface, we have developed programs which each of our graduate students, team members, and alumni will describe our body of awakened activism for a more awakened society. Dr. Scalora, would you like to go first? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So we started Awakened Awareness, the um, program for undergraduate college students in 2017. And how this came to be is there was a spat, there's a spat of suicides um, on the campus of Columbia and around the country actually, this is, was an epidemic, is an epic, adem, epidemic. And um, so what we did was we, Dr. Miller developed um, awakened awareness through 15 to 16 years of curriculum development and process um, in classes. And so what we did was we adapted awakened awareness for adolescents, for late adolescents, emerging adults, um, 18 to 25, and we developed an eight-week, 90-minute um, program um, once a week, and we started um, teaching it um, in person, and that was in fall 2018, and I want to talk a little bit about the program itself. Um, so it's really to support college students in the developmental tasks of identity development and spiritual individuation. And when we started um, advertising the program, you know, we talked about how it was to help them with stress and there was meditation and um, really all sorts of things to support them in their growth. And we had a bunch of students come to the first orientation and we asked them why they came. And they all wanted to learn, most of them, I would say 90% wanted to learn to meditate and have less stress. Um, and as we started the, the workshops, we started talking about meditation and also other things, important things like meaning in life and started using language such as higher self, um, that everyone has a higher self. And we talked about higher power and having a relationship with the sacred, transcendent, what does that look like? And I have to tell you, it's like their eyes light up and they would 
resonate with these these terms and say they never knew that was like the language. Um, they'd never heard the terms before, but they'd had the experiences and they started telling us about their experiences. And that really led to this conversation that was very unique on a college campus. And I say unique because they told us it was unique, that they weren't able to talk this way um, in their other classes. And that actually when they were in their academic classes, they felt this sense of what we call achievement awareness, which Dr. Muller um, spoke about, where they felt like they were competing against each other. And they would use the terminology um, misery Olympics, you know, who's working harder, who's more miserable. And, and this awakened awareness group, they were able to talk about things that were real for them and their experiences in a way that they, some of them had never talked to anyone in this way before. And really this workshop is designed to like foster that connection. It really is a spiritual community. And I just, I, I have so many stories um, that I can think of to talk about, but um, one that always sticks out in my mind is one student, because um, we work, so awakened awareness really has this arc and it starts out with relationship to self, relationship to others, and then relationship to the world. And what we learned is we had to spend a little more time on relationship to self because that wasn't something that really they thought about before. And so through these different meditations, they started to think about how they related to themselves. And that's where the higher self comes in, that they all have a higher self. That's something that's inherent. And this higher self is a loving and compassionate self. Um, and so through these meditations and, and discussion, we had this one student who talked about if she got a 98 on her math exam, she was a failure. That two points made her a failure. And I just remember this one moment in the workshop when she kind of had this epiphany. She said, this isn't my voice. This is my mom's voice. And she started to question if her major was what she really wanted to do. And she actually ended up changing majors. So this, the awakened awareness is really for them to connect with themselves in a much deeper way. And then connect, as I mentioned, like with the transcendent, whatever that may be for them. And that is open. It could be nature. It could be religious figure. It could be the planet. It, I've heard people say the sun is their higher power. So it really gives them, they're in a context where they can develop that part of themselves. And that's the individuation process and really think deeply about who they are and where they're going and what their purpose in life is. And so it's, it's quite unique. Um, and we ran that for about, I want to say four years. It ended in spring 2020, Elizabeth, am I right on that? 21. It's still going, actually. It's still going. Dr. Mish Anderson, jump in. Hi. I'm so excited to be here um, and see all of my friends and friendly faces. Um, you know, this work is really, I think, the I, for me, it was an opportunity in some ways of a lifetime, certainly of my academic lifetime. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Scalora and I have worked very closely also with Elizabeth um, on this project. And, you know, one of the things that I came into graduate school really interested in was understanding kind of how spirituality works and what does it do for people? How does it actually bring about well-being and change and not just in sort of the way that we talk about it, but also from this question and the stance of the mind-body connection. Um, and Dr. Miller, as you know, I came in very excited about these kinds of ideas and awakened awareness really provided us the opportunity to sort of test some of these concepts. Um, Specifically, you know, there's a lot of conversation, certainly in popular culture, about spirituality and what it can do for us. 
Um, but as a scientist, I'm really interested in sort of the ways that these things work on a really sort of granular level. Um, and so coming into this project and really seeing and starting to understand and think about how we can examine this, um, particularly among students who experience, you know, mark levels of stress during any sort of uh, part of their undergraduate or graduate experience um, and understanding, you know, that they come in looking for what they call kind of stress reduction um, and what that means on, you know, a cardiovascular level, on sort of um, a biological level. And so that's really what I'm excited to talk about today is, you know, these concepts um, that really in the literature very much connect spirituality to cardiovascular health, which I think there's a, there's a well-documented connection between this. Um, and there are theories out there about why that exists. And so I came into this and we've come into this sort of thinking, how, how can we look at this among this beautiful sample that we have and these beautiful students who are coming in? Um, and what might this bring about for them physiologically that might, that might change alongside their spiritual experience? So, you know, we see in other samples and in other literature, this connection between um, cardiovascular function and spiritual experience. And the way that we've often thought about this um, has been related to stress. So stress has and triggers a response in everyone's body um, and psychological stress, just as physical stress can manifest the same sort of responses. Um, and that can look like um, an exaggerated cardiovascular response in some people. That can look like a blunted response in other people, depending on their psychological sort of presentation. Um, and so, you know, we, we ask these questions and looking at these larger, more representative samples of people, that people who endorse um, having a lifelong sort of sense of spiritual experience and spirituality actually die less frequently and, and die maybe later than do people related to cardiovascular function than do people who do not. Um, and so on a smaller scale, thinking about, you know, everyday stressors and the way that our, our body responds to them. So we decided that we were going to look at this within this awakened awareness project. Um, and so, you know, we sort of set up this experimental, um, this experiment within the, the study where we looked at students' um, reactivity and recovery from a stress task. And before we looked at this before and after the study, um, before the intervention, before and after the intervention, and we looked at the changes in specifically what we call heart rate variability, which is a, an index of parasympathetic and sympathetic responses. Um, and in the literature, there is this relationship in other uh, studies between both um, an intervention that brings about change in, in heart rate variability and then changes in heart rate variability that can induce a spiritual experience. So there's this bi-directional relationship and kind of starting to understand what happens across an intervention can give us a clue as to how these robust indexes of well-being and health look are, are, are appearing sort of um, on an individual level. Um, and so we looked at heart rate variability before and after the intervention. We looked at reactivity and recovery from reactivity to and recovery from a stress task. And we saw really robust changes um, in, 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 de, in indexes of heart rate variability that respond specifically to um, parasympathetic activity and the balance between parasympathetic activity and sympathetic activity. So this idea that we experience a stressful experience and as we want a very nice, robust response to that from our body, but we also want to return to baseline very quickly. And we saw that with our, our changes in recovery to stress. Um, but what was even much cooler in this sample and in this project is that we actually see that there is this um, spiritual recovery uh, that's reported, this recovery and spiritual decline that's reported that is related directly related to how we recover from stress. So students, as Susan was talking about, really report sort of having these spiritual struggles that they recover from across the delivery of this intervention. And we see that as being directly related to their physiological recovery from stress. And so that is very exciting. It's this idea that we have these mind-body connections and that at any given moment, our spiritual experience and our spiritual well-being is related to our physiological well-being. 
and how we process and handle everyday stressors. Um, we also saw in this sample that, and I think Susan, you know, kind of mentioned this, that we have students who are really experiencing a high level of stress and trauma, and that we see that this, um, that that within this uh, intervention and across this intervention, they have a changed response, uh, physiological response that that correlates with that change in uh, clinical symptomatology. So, like as they sort of improve in their um, their trauma-related symptoms, there's a change in physiological response that parallels that. Um, so this is like, to me, just one of the most exciting things that I've worked on. And I think that we really can see both on a psychological level and a spiritual level that there are these changes, but it really tracks with what these uh, students are experiencing in terms of their body's response to stress. How that relates to what goes on down the road and hopefully how that relates to their health and well-being down the road, we don't know. Um, but my guess is that if these are sustained sort of spiritual um, changes in spiritual well-being and they continue to sort of practice and engage in this enhanced perception across the course of their lifetime, that there may be changes in the way that their body sort of responds to stress over time and hopefully sort of in increases their longevity and well-being being across the course of their life. Um, so that's really what I'm here for. And obviously, I'm so excited to share this with everyone. Um, but this was such, a, such an honor to be a part of this. So thank you. Dr. Anderson, thank you. So you heard from Dr. Scalora and Dr. Anderson the way in which we took the roadmap of basic science and transformed a blueprint into an actual series of practices through which any emerging adult might avail him or herself of awakening through understanding, through science, through practices, and through spiritually grounded relationship. Awakened awareness was developed over 20 years with graduate students and adults. And yet when it came time to engage emerging adults, college students, 18 through 24, we quickly saw there was a need to adapt the awakening process in this period of rapid growth, of quest, of questioning and struggle. And Dr. Scalora and Dr. Anderson spent months and months and years together at SMBI figuring this out. And we now have a program that any university can pick up. And indeed, we are now partnering with uh, well-known universities on the West Coast to spread awakened awareness for emerging adults, college students. Dr. Masur, we have coming up Awakened Campus. We are going to not only share our way of working, but invite the whole country to Teachers College, depending on public health, virtually or in person. And together, we're going to exchange practices and language and science to support spiritual emergence in emerging adults. Dr. Mistura is helping to head up Awaken Campus, and she will tell you about the clergy, the spiritual directors and deans, the counselors and mental health professionals, all who will be converging to Teachers College so that we can move forward with a new normal, a new sense of what really is whole student development at the college level and how that might integrate foundationally the spiritual core. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And it's really exciting to be um, not only working on this project, but actually uh, working on ways that we can share this Awaken Awareness program with, with more people and also come up with new and other ways um, to actually provide it um, on college campuses and on other campuses and beyond. Um, so in on April 1st, we are having our Awakened Campus Summit. Um, it, we believe it will be hybrid. There should be um, ways for the TC community to be in person and ways for others to join us online for um, many presentations of, of how we can actually do this. And so I'm very excited for that. Um, and I hope that we'll see you there. Um, I also would love to just share um, a story and, and a newer, uh, a more recent development um, with Awakened Awareness for undergrads. So just a story that came to mind when, when uh, Dr. Scalora and Dr. Anderson were talking was about um, a student we had who was really dealing with a, a very stressful time in her 
academic career and really received um, that knock at the door where, where she um, knew that her mental health was struggling and knew that um, she was questioning her, her spirituality and was really struggling in school and um, decided to actually take classes part-time and really pursue um, getting support. And so she went to therapy. She also came to Awaken Awareness um, at that time. And um, in interviewing her, she shared this beautiful unfolding over the course of Awakened Awareness, uh, over the course of these eight weeks, where she was able to use the um, foundationally spiritual tools that we offered to actually find her own sense of spirituality separate from her parents that she had grown up with. But at the same time, she was actually sharing what she was learning um, with her parents and they were going through their own uh, spiritual process as well. And it was such a beautiful story to hear how she was able to um, really individuate from her parents and yet celebrate their spirituality and they were able to celebrate hers as well um, and be supported in that through Awaken Awareness and through bringing her um, a new way of, of seeing and a new way of actually um, owning her spirituality and uh, helping it get her to the, to the other side and, and through this difficult period. And she found meaning and was just excited to finish her time at um, Columbia. And that was just really amazing to hear and awesome to see the, um, the cross-generational impact that this can have as well. Um, and I also wanted to share that um, over COVID, we have continued to be able to um, provide this resource for students. So we were in the middle of providing a on-campus workshop for students when the COVID-19 pandemic hit in March of 2020. And we immediately had to get our minds together and shift onto Zoom. And so we just kept going and decided to offer it on Zoom. And most of our students who didn't have too much of a time zone difference stayed with us. And um, they were supported in their uh, spiritual individuation through the collective trauma of COVID. And so um, we now um, are offering Awaken Awareness both online and in person. Uh, amidst the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so that's really exciting to be able to be um, accessible to students uh, in and through really difficult crises and difficult times. There's a natural spirituality that can be fostered and strengthened for better health, wellness, and even outward performance, fitness and readiness. We have applied this basic framework to innovative work in collaboration with the US Pentagon. We have applied the roadmap of science to K-12 schools with Awakened School Institute. And we are now launching Awakened Campus so that we can support spiritual development, which is really a birthright. If we look at longitudinal twin studies, there's a natural emergence of personal spiritual life and awakening in college. So between the work of the Pentagon, Awakened Schools, and Awaken Campus, we have a lot of energy here at Teachers College in the Spirituality Mind Body Institute. Before I introduce Amy, I wanna share perhaps one of the most broad reaching of our initiatives, which is in partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services, the Spirituality Mind Body Institute collaborated all of last year in a series of partnership formations between mental health providers, mainstream mental health providers, and high impact spiritual leaders and clergy. And almost like a layer cake, we put together partnerships to meet unmet pain and suffering, identify the needs that had gone unnoticed by the dominant system, and empower people to use all of themselves, their imagination, their expertise, their acumen, to create ways of supporting people who suffer with mental illness at a spiritual level, as well as their caretakers and families. The partnership model was so successful that we just received a million dollar grant 
from the Templeton Foundation to go to the next step and disseminate partnerships between mental health and spiritual leaders and clergy more broadly, as well as build a national platform to allow people to share practices, innovate, publish, and develop a sense of being a field with a clear common ground for languaging. So I'm delighted to support um, this work and I'm delighted to share this work uh, by sharing foremost our director, Dr. Amy Chapman, who's gonna fill you in. Thank you, Dr. Miller, or separate entities that I have a hand in uh, speak to the overarching nature of the need to create an awakened society, that this really does not just reach college students, but also starting in preschool and extending into adulthood. So I'll speak to the K-12 briefly first. We um, Our K-12 initiative um, through the Collaborative for Spirituality and Education relies on the research that says that while we are hardwired for spirituality, in order for that spirituality to blossom along with any other parallel line of human development, it needs to be supported, nurtured, cultivated in an environment where it can flourish. When we think about where kids spend most of their time, in addition to families and in some aspects in civic society, that's in schools. And so we've been looking through research at what schools can do to be spiritually supportive of children. We spent three years in over 20 schools throughout the United States researching what master educators do to create a spiritually supportive school culture. Through that research, those partnerships, those rich relationships, We've distilled a blueprint for what any school, regardless of its culture, its language, its values, can implement. And so what we've decided to do is to offer that blueprint uh, in a very accessible way, both because it's free of cost to any participants and also because it's a hybrid model. So people from around the country, both schools with whom we are working in partnership and individuals who want to be change makers in their own schools and districts, can come for 12 online sessions to the Awakened Schools Institute, where we are teaching our process of change and sharing with them our research. We're also nourishing them in the very best model of teacher education. What does it mean to learn in a spiritually supportive environment? And so that is what we are creating for the teachers in the hope that they then create it for their students. The schools with which we are partnering now through that institute, there are eight of them, public schools throughout the country, will receive site visits where we can tailor professional development experiences, coaching, one-on-one -on -one visits to classrooms um, to work with each school or district, depending on their needs, where their school is and the changes that they would like to make. Okay, that's the little guys. We also have this wonderful work that we do uh, from the great, uh, beneficence of the John Templeton Foundation, where we join the work that was begun at Health and Human Services and SMBI between faith-based mental health practitioners. So people who are coming from both of those worlds and saying, people get better faster, particularly in marginalized communities, when those things work in concert. And so what we did was we reached out to the people who had been involved in a webinar series that SMBI and Health and Human Services had put on in the fall of 2020 and said, look, if you're interested in running some kind of pilot project or you have an idea of a problem you see in your community, that you have an idea of how to solve that problem, we'd like to help give you a little bit of funding so that you can. That funding seems to have been a catalyst for eight different projects throughout the United States from Pennsylvania to Washington. And they're all working, it turns out, with marginalized groups, people who are uh, less likely to seek mental health services or who are more likely to go to a clergy person than they are to a mental health practitioner. These range from African-American men to veterans to caregivers to the elderly. The projects vary uh, in scope, in size. They vary in region. They vary in the number of partners who are working with uh, together collaboratively. Um, but they are all excited, energetic people who are addressing local needs in their communities. What that means, the benefit of that, is that those people know on the ground the people that they're working with and what those needs are and how best to solve them in collaboration with people who are also in their local community. 
I'm just going to give you one example of one such program. Veterans Recovery Resources, which is based in Mobile, Alabama, serves veterans who are coming back, who have left the service, who are not seeking mental health treatment from the VA or from anywhere else. And they provide a very rich complement of services to those veterans uh, to get them in the door, to get them access to any level of service. And so on that team, we have members of the clergy, we have clinical psychologists, we have mental health practitioners at other levels. And they come and they say, look, how are we going to make it a safe space, a comfortable space, an okay space for these veterans to come and talk to us. Let's get them in the door. And so they're using our funding. Uh, they hired an outreach coordinator, someone who's literally going into the community, knocking on doors and saying, hey, we offer this, come talk to us. And they invite people, someone who is a veteran is doing that, to come on down and have conversations. And it starts the ball rolling. People feel comfortable. They want to be there. And that starts a road to recovery, they're finding. And so with this new grant, we'll be able to expand that program, elevate some of our original projects uh, on the national stage so that those people can serve as leaders, another thing that TC is terrific at doing, as well as to encourage new projects. Uh, that we did not find the only eight projects, eight people, eight collaborators in the country who have seen problems in their community and have an idea of how to fix them. So this opens the door to allow us to invite more people who have that same energetic, enthusiastic desire to change the world in their starting in their local place um, to do so. And I appreciate being here with this very uh, esteemed group of women. Thanks. For sharing our awakening work. And I know we're almost out of time. I'm wondering if we might go around once and share with people what has been perhaps the most moving moment in the work, or perhaps the most engaging scientific finding, but a little gift for our friends, a little thank you gift for joining us today and something to take home, if you will, an enlightened party favor. I'm happy to jump in. I, I just think the most amazing thing for me personally has been the honor and privilege of getting to learn and grow alongside students in Awakened Awareness. Um, I am constantly learning from them. There is no group who's been the same and they continually bring awakened perspectives um, that, that I haven't even heard yet. Uh, and it just so much shows that we are not um, teachers, but just guides in this work and passing along uh, the awakened awareness. And um, there's just been moments I've been brought to tears um, hearing students' stories and seeing their tremendous growth uh, in, in these sessions. And so getting to be a witness to that has been really beautiful. Yeah, I would agree with that, Elizabeth. I would say my my it's just been a blessing. It's been incredible. And I am so humbled to sit with these students who are so amazing. And the transformations that I've witnessed are incredible in a very short amount of time, eight weeks. And there's so many stories, but there's always one that stands out to me. Um, a young woman and Mish, Dr. Anderson will know who I'm talking about, who came to Awakened Awareness when she didn't want to one day because it was the anniversary of her father's death. And the group sat with her. We did a particular meditation. And that meditation, the group changed her life. And, and that's her words. And she had said, what she said to me in months and months later when we talked was that when she arrived at Awakened Awareness, she saw the world in black and white. The color had gone out of her world because she was so devastated by the loss of her beloved father. And through her process, the, her very deep process during Awakened Awareness, she found her father again. And she had this 
beautiful moment that she described to me that happened probably a month or two after awakened awareness where the world turned to color again. And she said that could not have happened if she had not had that time and that space and the group, that spiritual community with her to be able to transcend, like she actually transcended this experience of grief. And I'll always carry that with me. Um, and like Elizabeth said, like it really brings me to tears, um, even to this day, to think about the impact of this program. So I am just so blessed and so thankful and want to thank everybody on this panel because everyone has played such a huge role. And absolutely, it is been an amazing and will continue to be an amazing experience. Thank you. I, I think that, um, that, that there has been plenty that has been said that I would echo. Um, I think for myself, the being able to be a witness is just such a privilege. Um, and also, you know, one thing I, I can say is we, all of us lived through this period, particularly, you know, in the, in the geographical setting of New York, where we were leading this program when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Um, and one thing I was really sort of struck by was as much as this, that experience of these students were, were moved home in the middle of their experience, you know, displaced some of them, um, put back in sort of these what what many of them i think were were moving away from and individuating from which was their you know childhood home um and i was just so struck by the resilience and the grace with which they moved across cities across um settings moving away from the the graduation that lay in front of them um i i was really just honored to be able to kind of hold that space, even virtually. I think we had a lot of misgivings about whether we could do this work virtually, whether we could move from in-person to virtual. And in some senses, it was the most intimate sort of, of settings that we could, we could hold because people were in their homes and they were sort of put back into these places that they had come from. Um, so for me, I think, you know, being able to not only serve in this role, as Elizabeth said, as a guide, um, and also right along with them go through this major stressor um, that many, you know, many people, all of us sort of experienced alongside each other. Um, that was really humbling. And I just was really awestruck by their ability to do it with, with such finesse and, and really with such acceptance. Um, so that's, that, that was, I think for me, the, the, the most striking example I can think of. Bear witness is what came up for me too. I'm a qualitative researcher and an applied scientist. And so from both of those perspectives, I listen to people's stories and I bear witness to them in my work. And it's been such a privilege and such a grace to do that with two groups of people who are real change agents in their areas. And as I was thinking about this conversation, I was thinking that in a lot of ways, the spaces that we co-create for them with them are a lived experience of the areas of perception in the brain that are spiritual, that we are loved, we are held, we are guided, we are not alone in those spaces and that that's pretty profound. Um, so that's, that's what I'm taking from this. Um, in addition to the great privilege of hearing anyone's, anyone's individual story, uh, which is, there's not so much that's more profound. I want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Susan Scalora, Dr. Mish Anderson, Dr. Amy Chapman, and Elizabeth Mistour, soon to be doctor, and say how grateful we are to be able to share with our friends and our TC community the energetic work that's been going on at the Spirituality Mind Body Institute. Using the map of basic science, we've been able to create innovative interventions, innovative programs so that children, young adults, and those who suffer the most have their chance to awaken, to strengthen their own spiritual heart, and to be renewed. Thank you all for coming. Please feel free to drop by and see us.